I was so incredibly tired. Simply put, I don't believe that managing your electrolytes when you're transitioning to carnivore is going to be just as easy as dumping a packet of element into your water once a day and then you're fine. We hear a lot about, okay, well, just listen to your body. The problem with that is I didn't have to deal with this stuff the first time around because I still kept alcohol in my life. I broke down in tears and I didn't know why at first. I thought, All right, everybody, today's day 90 for me on the carnivore diet. I'm going to be talking with you today about everything I've learned over the last three months. I think you'll get a lot out of this video if you're somebody who is in this, you know, zero to 90 day range where you're you're transitioning, you're learning about how to tweak things on this diet, you're figuring out what you like, what your body's craving, but you're still kind of struggling with some things kind of along the lines of, hey, help, carnivore is not working for me yet because there have been days over these past three months where I've gotten scared, like, what if carnivore isn't working for me like it did the first time? What if this diet isn't the end-all be-all for me? What if I am forced to add in something else that I can't tolerate for reasons that I'm going to get into? And and that can be a little bit scary. So I'm here to try to just share what, I, what I've been through in hopes that can help you. So I'll put up a little list of all of the timestamps, all the things that we're going to be talking about today. And then, of course, these will be in the description. So feel free to jump around click on whatever topic interests you. Um, I know that not everybody has the time to watch this video in its entirety, and you're going to be hearing possibly some background noise throughout the video from my three-year-old who is uh, playing here in the background, but I won't be offended if you jump around or just click on specific things that you're interested in, in hearing about. I try to make these update videos pretty robust and include a lot of details because I hoping that there'll be a resource for people as they move through their journey. And so at each kind of landmark, I want to include as much information and insight um, from my own personal perspective and journey that I possibly can. So first, I'm going to give you just a quick background on my history, what I'm recovering from, why I came to the carnivore diet. The next thing I'm going to talk about is all the factors that have become very relevant to me in terms of adapting. And I have some comments and some hacks for each of these things. We're going to talk about electrolytes and water intake, fat to protein ratios, exercise, sleep, stress, and the other category um, at the end, just to kind of touch on all of these things that play a role in how fast you get fat adapted, how fast your body can transition from whatever your previous diet was to this new way of eating. Then I want to talk about digestion because that is part of uh, what I really found relief from during my first round of carnivore, but I have had some struggles here in this second transition, and so I want to touch on that and elaborate more from what I talked about in my 60-day update video. Then I want to discuss, okay, what is going on if, let's say, you've tried all of these things that, that we talked about in the first part of the video, or you think you have a pretty good handle on these but yet you're still having weird symptoms. You still feel like some things are getting worse and you feel like maybe, you know, maybe the carnivore diet's not working for you at this point. Maybe you need to start thinking about adding in back some carbs or adding in some vegetables or fruit or something else. If you're somebody who is questioning whether this way of eating is even going to work for you, I want to have a little bit of a discussion about that and some things that have just kind of... <laughs> like a bombshell uh, become apparent to me right as I've been approaching my 90 days. And I think it's kind of interesting and ironic that it happened at the time that it did. And so I'm going to offer some suggestions and just some things to think about regarding that. And then at the very end, uh, so you want to stick around till then, I'm going to tell you exactly how I know what to try next. And I don't think I've heard anybody else in any nutrition community talk about this. And again, this is something that just kind of came to me very recently, and I think it's uh, very true. And so I'm going to share that with you at the very end. I will ask you before we jump into the first point that we're going to discuss today, that if you find this video helpful, if it touches you in any way, or you think that it would help someone who you know who is suffering in silence, that's the that's who I would hope you would share this with. And that's the reason why I make these videos. I don't make these videos necessarily because it's comfortable for me or because I enjoy sharing about, 
you know, how my bathroom habits are and how many milligrams of salt I'm taking. But I feel that because of what I've been through and because of the relief and the health and the perspective that I have now, it's my duty to share what I've learned, what I know, and it's it's my duty to try to help reach people who, for whatever reason, might be suffering in silence. Because that's what I did for many years, many, many years. I did my best to hide uh, what I was feeling, what I was going through, and I didn't want anyone to know. And I think there's a lot of people out there that are experiencing this. And so I would just ask for... Uh, your support and sharing and, you know, hitting the like button if you feel compelled to do that. And I always love to read your comments about anything you're struggling with or any of your successes. And so please feel free to leave those below as well. Okay, let's get into the first point, which is just a very quick uh, background on where I've come from. So I struggled uh, since I was a teenager from IBS type symptoms bowel pain, bloating, gas. I went on my own experiment, N equals one type journey uh, for about 12 to 13, probably 14 years, trying different diets. I was plant-based for a while. I tried vegan. I tried raw vegan. And then I found the ancestral way of eating. So I progressed from paleo down to keto. And then I went carnivore, got tons of relief, all my digestive symptoms, went into remission, my brain fog disappeared. And then I got pregnant. I got very sick and I went off the diet. I allowed the comfort foods to come back into my life. And then I've struggled to get off those comfort foods and go back low carb again. So I'm on round two of carnivore now and today is my 90th day. Okay, adapting to this diet. Let's talk about first electrolytes because I know this is a big one. A lot of people have different opinions about electrolytes what you should do, how much you should do. And I think it is and can be quite an individual thing. Simply put, I don't believe that managing your electrolytes when you're transitioning to carnivore is going to be just as easy as dumping a packet of element into your water once a day and then you're fine and you don't really have to worry about it. I mean, maybe that works for some people and I'm jealous of, of you if, if that's been your experience. But for me, it was not like that. I've had to really play around to find what is is working for me and that actually can change based on what else is going on in my life. And so that's kind of the main point I want to get across talking about electrolytes and water today is that surface level, it just takes some time. It takes some time and it takes effort to understand the balance of, of what you're consuming in different areas, including food and water and the actual minerals themselves. And then I really believe that every point that we're going to talk about, including sleep and stress and exercise and some of these other things, tie into what your electrolytes should look like. Coffee is an example of this. If you are still drinking coffee like me, like I am still on my carnivore diet, coffee can deplete your minerals. Coffee is a diuretic. It's going to make you go potty more. And so when you potty, you can tell him. So if you're still having coffee or you're having a lot of coffee, like I do some days, and I'm going to get more into that, that can really mess up your electrolyte status. And so depending on what, what you're doing with coffee, even coming off of coffee, that might throw off your electrolyte balance as your body adjusts to that if it was used to having a daily two, three cups, even just one cup of coffee. So you might need to give that some time for that to adjust. Alcohol is another one. I know probably most people have uh, given up alcohol or are not drinking alcohol on a carnivore diet. This is something I did my first round of carnivore. I drank quite a bit of alcohol. I talk about that in my other videos. Uh, but this, one, this time, I am not drinking any alcohol. I've had zero drops of alcohol since day one of this round two of carnivore. And I think that has played a major role in kind of my electrolytes taking some time to, for my body rather, taking more time to figure out how much sodium I need, how much potassium, how much magnesium, because that all of that affects how your body holds water, how it releases water, how it's holding on to minerals, etc. Alcohol can also interfere with fat metabolism and your adaptation process. And I'll see if I can find the links. This was a long time ago that I that I was researching this, but uh, essentially, because alcohol is a toxin, it is a poison. It's seen by the body as something that needs to be broken down, metabolized, and excreted. Um, 
when you are in a fat metabolism state, that process has to be paused in order for the body to deal with the alcohol. Especially when you're trying to adapt to a ketogenic or a carnivore diet, you really don't want to be drinking, in my opinion, because that's just going to interrupt the process of fat metabolism. It's just going to prolong, it, it seems to me that it would prolong the time that it takes for your body to get adjusted. The next thing is oversalting or undersalting foods. Now, I know there's lots of different opinions about salt and how much you should have. I know there's some carnivores who don't salt at all. There's some carnivores who do salt their food. And so, again, this is going to depend a lot on what are these other beverages you might be having or not having, how many electrolytes are you adding to your water, you know, so do you need salt on your food or not? This is all just going to start to naturally make more sense to you the longer you do this. The more of these other areas you get in balance, the more they kind of all, I feel like, they sink and they help each other out. So that's why we're discussing a lot of these different things. And I think as we go along, you'll see how these all fit together. Personally, I started out by undersalting. I don't think I was getting nearly enough sodium and that was partly why I was feeling so tired in the beginning. So then I kind of overcorrected for that by going, oh my gosh, I need more electrolytes. So let me add a lot more sodium or it was more like small amounts much more often. And I overcorrected for that. I ended up having like my hands would get swollen, my feet would get swollen. I would be having excessive urination, waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, all these kinds of things. And so when I realized, hey, I think I'm overdoing it on the sodium in particular, I need to back off from that. So I backed off from the salt that I was putting on the meats that I was eating. And I backed off on the amount of electrolytes that I was consuming in my water. And now I think I'm finally at a spot where I feel like I know when to add and when to cut back a little bit based on the, the little micro fluctuations that I get in, like I said, I look at my hands and feet. Do I have swollen fingers? Are my toes swollen? Are my ankles a little bit swollen? Then that means I should probably cut back on the salt a little bit for my next meal. Am I having cravings, like sugar cravings, or just feeling really snacky, like I just want to eat something even though I'm not feeling hungry? Or if I'm feeling you know, excessive fatigue again, I know, oh, maybe I'm underdoing it on the sodium or on the electrolyte mix. And so I just bump it up a little bit in the next, you know, glass of water that I have. I recently published a video about how I make my electrolytes at home. I think that's an important point to bring up here because for two reasons, and there's these two reasons are why I made that video is because first off, um, it's much more affordable. I used element ratios and I made a bulk batch. So if you want to go check that video out, if you haven't seen it yet, that will show you exactly how to make basically element at home for a very, very, very low cost per serving. And that's great so that you have kind of that cushion where you're not saying, oh, I, I can really only afford to have one of these a day or I have to kind of save them for one every other day because maybe it's not in your budget to be buying lots and lots of these packets. This is going to provide you with enough electrolytes at a good cost so that you can experiment with a little bit more for a time period to see if that helps you. The other reason why I think it's important to make yours at home is so that you can tweak the ratio as you learn more and as your body becomes more adapted. You can maybe cut back the sodium a little bit. Maybe you're feeling like, hey, I want more magnesium. You can add some more. Or maybe you want to try a different form of potassium to see if that helps you absorb it better or if it tastes a little bit different. So there's all these really great tweaks that you can make with your electrolytes when you make them yourself. It puts you in control over that versus kind of having to be stuck with a certain formula until you finish it kind of a thing. So that's why I'm making mine at home and that's really helped me figure out exactly what I want to be having and how much for my electrolytes. Next, let's talk about fat to protein ratios. What should you be doing? What should you be having? And how does this affect digestion? Because this is what I've been playing with the most to try to regulate my digestion. And again, it took me basically till day 90 to get this right. And this is no offense to anyone who says this, but I think sometimes uh, when we just hear like, okay, if you are feeling constipated, you just need more fat. And then if you're having diarrhea, you just need to cut back the fat. Well, I think that is actually true. I think the, the mechanism by which that is being 
uh, described is true. I also think that there can be a little bit more to it, especially for those of us who have a history of digestive problems. And so I think one of the things to recognize is, you know, what was your previous diet? If you're coming to this way of eating from a highly processed diet or from a diet that was very different in terms of types of food, fiber content, you know, different things that you're you're going to excessively be excluding now with a carnivore diet, that can really take some time for your body to adjust. And even if you're eating the right amount of fat, you you might still be having the runs. Like that happened to me. And even if you're not eating enough fat, you might still have some diarrhea. Like that is just your your microbiome changing. And for some of us it just takes longer. I know that's not probably the answer anyone wants to hear, but that's basically the answer that I've realized is that it just took me about three months to really dial into how much I need to eat, as in portion sizes, how often I need to eat that, as in how hungry am I actually and how much food do I actually need, and then how much of that needs to be fat and how much of that should be protein. And again, we hear a lot about, okay, well, just listen to your body and eat what your body's telling you. But the problem with that is that we don't always know in the beginning because your cravings are all messed up because you're coming off of a highly processed diet or maybe a plant-based diet where you're not even used to eating meat. Or maybe even if it's a ketogenic diet, but you were eating a bunch of keto treats and diet sodas or something like that. It This is such a drastic change for most of us that it can actually be really hard to know what you're craving and how hungry you really are and when something tastes good and when it doesn't. I know these are actually things I sat at the table and thought about while I was eating like, okay, Nia, does this still taste good? I don't know the answer to that. Like I couldn't even, I couldn't, I didn't know. And so again, these things just take time and that's not the fun answer. That's not the exciting answer. It's not a definitive answer. But the more you can turn inward during this process, I think it's good to go outward and look at other carnivores, other people who are experienced and try to get nuggets from them and try to get advice and tips. But there's a line between doing research and looking for inspiration or motivation for something and then comparing yourself or your healing journey to someone else's who might be way further along the path, but you might not even know what their health history is or what they've overcome already. And then that can be really upsetting and demotivating sometimes when you're thinking, okay, well, this person just ate more fat and it fixed their digestion and that's not working for me. So the more you can turn inward and really get almost spiritual about what is going on with what you're putting in, listening to the reactions of your body, and taking quiet time to think about that, maybe writing down a food journal, all these things can help you adapt faster, like satiety signals, for instance. Like eating slowly is something that I've had to consciously learn how to do throughout this process because I don't know how hungry I am. Um, sometimes until I've already eaten too much, then I have an issue with going to the bathroom because I ate too much food at one time or I ate too much fat at one sitting. Maybe I might need more fat, but I need to split that up over two to three meals throughout the day instead of trying to eat one giant bolus of butter every 24 hours. And so slowing down is a good thing to practice. I cut my food up into like really small pieces. When I started out, I was just almost like shoveling food in, like, oh, I'm so excited to eat. You know, let's get this this carnivore thing done and move on and, and be done with eating. But I'd be eating these like big mouthfuls of food, trying to chew it, and I was probably not even chewing my food well enough. I was maybe drinking too much water with my meals, maybe drinking not enough water with my meals. So if you can practice slowing down while you eat, cut your food into small pieces chew and enjoy each piece of food and think about it as you're chewing, which is the first part of digestion. How do I feel about this? How does my stomach feel? How does my, you know, my digestive system feel? How does my, is my jaw tight? Am I, you know, like there's all these little signals that you'll pick up on about stress in your body and about 
how you are literally digesting throughout the entire process. And so I hope that makes sense. But slowing down is what I've been doing, being really mindful. And that plus time and patience is what has gotten me to a place where I don't have these digestive episodes anymore. I'm feeling like I really understand more about how much I exactly need and when I should eat that. And so slow down, give it time and patience, and give yourself grace. Moving on to exercise. So I think exercise plays a, a major role in healing, and it's it has so many benefits in so many different ways. But I actually had to drop a lot of the exercise that I was doing. I was doing a lot of pretty strenuous cardio, I was doing Taibo classes. I was doing advanced yoga classes that require a lot of strength um, on the regular. And that was a mindset that I was in that I needed to push myself in every area of my life all the time. And that kind of was residual from, you know, the last few years of my life where I was kind of in that position where I had to be that way. I had to kind of burn the candle at both ends and and push myself really hard. And so that that mindset was very uh it was hard to let go of that but i i had this intuitive nudge i was like i just can't i can't handle this and the main reason i knew i had to do this is because i was so incredibly tired and every time i would exercise i within a few hours i it's like i could not do anything for the rest of the entire day i struggled to do dishes i struggled to wash a load of laundry after that like i had to lay down um in between doing everything because i i couldn't i could barely even think and i realized that that degree of extreme fatigue was only when i would do these workouts these more strenuous workouts and so i realized i needed to stop doing that and that was really hard for me because again i i like to exercise i like to push myself i like to i mean it makes me feel better in my body and so that's something i had to let go of in order to get past this transition phase and let my body become fat adapted. Right now what I'm doing for exercise on that note is I'll do gentle or restorative yoga probably about three times a week. And then I go play on the playground with my kid. We go to the park, we climb the ropes, we slide the slides. I will like hang and decompress my shoulders and back on the, you know, whatever like bars there are. Uh, we spin on the spinny things, we teeter on the totters, we just go and have fun, and I run around with her like a kid. And it's actually really great. It's getting outside, getting fresh air, you're around a bunch of kids, you, you're hearing a lot of laughter, you're hearing, you know, you're just watching kids be funny, and you get to engage with your kid, and it's, it's really cool. Okay, next let's talk about sleep. And sleep is something that I wouldn't say necessarily I've struggled with. Definitely the problems that I've had with sleep are due to other lifestyle factors, like the fact that I typically co-sleep still with, with my little one. More often than not, she's, you know, snuggling in with me at night. And so that's something that has been waking me up multiple times throughout the night, essentially, since she was born. And so that's sort of a an issue that I have that's not related to the carnivore diet. Because of the fatigue, I have no problem going to sleep at night. I can usually fall asleep immediately and I sleep pretty well outside of the fact that I was waking up around five to six times a night. Like every little movement would wake me up or every little sound would wake me up. I think I mentioned in my 60 day update how even a light, a tiny little light shining from my closet that I didn't realize was on would wake me up at night sometimes. And so I don't think the quality was there. I don't think the ability to get that deep, restful, restorative sleep was there. And that is an improvement that I have noticed is that I'd say on average, instead of five to six times waking up at night, I wake up an average of two, maybe three times. I'd say three is actually becoming a little bit more rare now. And so that's definitely an improvement. I'm starting to naturally wake up and feeling like, yeah, I could get up between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m., which for me is perfect right now. I typically go to bed between 10 and 11 p.m., depending on the day, depending on what I have going on. And so that's a solid eight hours generally of sleep, sometimes a little bit less. 
And I also take naps. You guys, I take naps with my little one. Whenever she takes a nap, 80 to 90% of the time, I'm napping with her. And that's been really hard for me. I've had a lot of guilt about that because I'm like, no, I should be up, you know, scrubbing this or finishing up this laundry or working on a video. I should be writing, editing, cleaning, doing something. But I have had to kind of back off, retrain myself here to accept more rest in my life when it's available to me. And that's been making a huge difference. And so I know this is a hard one for people because we're all busy. We all have goals. You all have like endless reasons to not sleep enough. But please get your sleep and take a nap. I am going to leave a link to a video that I found really helpful for anybody who feels like they are having that issue where they're waking up in the middle of the night, like wide awake, and they're with that sort of cortisol spike. And they don't know what to do about that. And I have not had that experience. And so I don't have any like personal tips from my own experience. But the one I'm going to link below, I thought was really good. It's by Rebecca Heishman. I think her channel is her name and then um, True Keto Health or something like that. And I think she just walks through everything very thoroughly and gives a lot of great tips if that's something that you're suffering from because that is terrible when you can't get enough sleep so if you're having insomnia or you're struggling to get a good night's rest on a consistent basis and you've been doing this for a minute go check out her video stress that's what's next we've kind of touched on stress a little bit already in in different ways but i wanted to give it its own category because i think it's so incredibly important that we do everything we can, especially during the transition time, to reduce the stress in our lives. This goes with the exercise thing, right? Not overstressing your body physically while it's trying to figure out how to operate and in, in a completely different mechanistic way. This goes for sleep, right? Not depriving ourselves of sleep and kind of forcing ourselves to stay up late and get up early like I was doing in the beginning thinking, oh, I should be adapted right away and I shouldn't need as much sleep. Like, you still need your sleep and it's stressful if if you don't get that. And I've taken that further into the immediate environment that I have control over to try to create like a temperature and a vibration in my home that is low stress. So I do this with lighting. I try to only use natural light. I have lots of giant, beautiful windows. I'm so grateful for these because... 90% of the time, I'm just letting natural light in during the day. And then in the evenings, I try to use um, not the main bright lights in here. I try to use candles. I try to use lamps. I try to use um, only the lights that I absolutely need to be on to do a task like washing dishes. And then I'll turn that, you know, over sink light off and we'll have a lamp on or something like that just to keep the vibe very low stimulus. I'm also using music. I like to put on, I've mentioned I like jazz and classical and I just, I found this channel that always has like the perfect jazz mix on and so I put that on while I'm cooking and while I'm cleaning and while we're just sit, hanging out playing low in the background and it just keeps that subtle vibration of relaxation going. I talked about this in my 60 day update video but even the clothes that I put on or my self-care routine, the way I'm trying to take care of myself on a regular basis better, all of that helps me just feel better in general. And that reduces my stress. And so I think it just makes it easier for my body to, you know, accept these new changes, and really do this healing work that's happening, especially during this first transition phase. And lastly, this is a category that I don't have a lot of again, personal experience in, but I wanted to leave some resources in case anybody's concerned about things like mold toxicity or maybe metal toxicity or some of these other things that are being talked about a little bit in the community when you, you've kind of checked all these other boxes, but there's still something going on. These are some other areas to explore. So let's say you're like me and you've been working with all these different things. You've been messing with your electrolytes. You've been messing with your portion sizes, your fat to protein ratios, the different types of food you're eating, when you're eating, your exercise, your stress, your environment, your candles, everything. But you're having some joint pain on and off like I was, which I've never had in my life before. You're having some psoriasis flare-ups like I've been having that just seem very persistent and they almost heal, but then they flare up again. And you're going, okay, I didn't really change anything. Like, 
what what could be the cause of this? Maybe you're having these weird changes in, in bowel movements after you've had a week or two of really good bowel movements. Maybe you notice your headaches are coming back or you're having a breakout every now and then. Maybe your hormones feel off or like your mood is just not stable. All of these things were things that have been happening to me on and off over these last three months. And I've been sitting here going, what is happening? The first time I did carnivore, none of these things happened. My digestion normalized very quickly. I didn't have any skin flare-ups. I didn't have any breakouts. My mood stabilized and I felt great. The brain fog disappeared. But this time I'm noticing like the brain fog is real certain days and I just feel like I don't want to get out of bed. And then two days later, I'll feel amazing. What the heck is happening? And you know how they say when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, I feel like that's kind of what happened to me last week because I had heard about this information before. I had listened to this particular expert many times in the past. I was I was cognitively aware of what this is, but I had never thought that it had applied to me because I had been on carnival before. I had experienced so much healing that I thought, oh, this particular thing's not really an issue for me. So I just kind of threw it out, put it in the back of my mind. But then I watched a video from Bill Knott that popped up and he was talking about oxalate dumping and how he had experienced, I think it was a week or two of symptoms. Digestive, I believe, and I'll link the video below so you can watch it if you haven't seen it. And it was like something slapped me. I was like, this is this is what's happening to me. It just clicked. It's like this is every single symptom that I have had, every type of flare issue that I've had since I started carnivore the second time that didn't make any sense before. Now it makes sense. I'm dealing with oxalate poisoning. I'm dealing with oxalate dumping. And this is something that I did not experience my first round of carnivore. And I'm probably going to talk in a separate video once I learn a little bit more and really troubleshoot my own personal situation I'm going to deep dive into this more so about why I think that is but it caught me off guard this time and so I just want to throw this out there because I see some comments sometimes where people say oh carnivore is not working for me I gave it a try but I ended up feeling worse or I got these really bad headaches or my skin started rashing up or flaring up or I got this really bad joint pain or whatever symptom it might be and I don't know that everybody knows about the oxalate message from someone who's actually knowledgeable about this and oxalate poisoning oxalate removal from the system is kind of and very case-by-case -case individual thing. But thankfully, there is an expert on this topic, and it's Sally K. Norton. And I have heard of her before. I've watched a bunch of interviews with her, again, in the past, when I was like, oh, that's cool, but this isn't something that affects me. So as soon as I heard that Bill Knott video, I went to Sally's website, and I started reading, and I watched several interviews of hers on YouTube. And then I saw that she had an opening for a group, one of her group meetings, I think she does them every month. So I signed up for that meeting and I just did that meeting yesterday. And I got a lot out of the meeting. I think there was like 25 other people there who all are working on their own low oxalate journey. And so that's going to be kind of what I'm focusing on moving forward. And I think if you have any of these sort of idiopathic symptoms left over or your symptoms are getting worse, all of that could be attributed to this oxalate problem. And who among us has not eaten a diet previously that was high in oxalate? Especially when you start reading Sally Norton stuff, you listen to her speak, it's not that hard to do. And if you've been into the spinach smoothies and the almond stuff, a lot of the keto breads, the almond milk, all these things are so high in oxalate. We've been poisoning ourselves, guys, with all these healthy foods that they've been telling us are healthy. And so no wonder, right, we're having some of this because the carnivore diet is a no or extremely low oxalate diet. And so what happens, just to briefly discuss what I've learned so far, is that, you know, when you go from a quote unquote regular diet or a, a diet where you're having oxalate in your dietary intake and then you go carnivore, your body 
senses that, okay, no more oxalates coming in. It's safe to release all of these stored crystals, this, these designed to tear and rip and pierce our cells and damage us so that we don't eat these plants anymore because they don't want to die, okay? They want to reproduce and live too. They don't want to be eaten. And so they try to defend themselves. And we've been holding on to all this oxalate for so long without realizing what we're doing. And so when we go carnivore, the body starts to dump this toxin out. It starts to try to eliminate it. And sometimes that is too much. And so the toxic overload can cause like this weird knee pain that I was having after I exercised. My left knee, which I had a previous injury in many years ago, but anywhere there's damaged tissue or there's scar tissue, that is an area that is prone to collect these oxalate crystals. So I'm going to sign up for another one of her meetings. I would love, love, love to interview her, her here on this channel. So I'm going to go to another meeting or two, and then I'm going to consider reaching out to Sally to see if she'd like to have a discussion. If I still have questions, I'd love to hear anyone's experience on addressing oxalate toxicity or oxalate dumping, whatever you want to call it, in your own journey. I'd love to hear what helped you. I've got, again, all the notes, all the research. I got all the slides and I'm going to be really trying to choose a path for myself of perhaps adding some things in that are not carnivore foods. Not because I want to, not because I think my body needs them nutritionally, but perhaps to slow down the oxalate dumping to a place where it's more manageable for me when I'm feeling like one of these flare-ups is happening where I get the extreme fatigue, the psoriasis flare-up, all the other little fun hellish symptoms that come along with it. So to kind of wrap this up, put a little bow on it until the next video, I'm going to share with you this insight that has been one of the most profound realizations I've had as far as what is guiding me down the trail, what is guiding me into the next path that I need to explore to figure out how to heal further. And that is crying. When I first watched that Bill Knott video and I heard him talk about oxalates, I broke down in tears. And I didn't know why at first. I thought, this is weird. Why is this making me cry? It's just, he's just talking about oxalates. But I could tell in that moment that I knew because this was making me feel really emotional, I knew that that is the next thing that I need to explore. It's like if something triggers you and makes you feel really angry or something triggers you and makes you feel incredibly sad or incredibly emotional in some way to where you are like moved to tears, it's like, go investigate that, whatever that is more. And that's probably going to teach you something. And so that might sound really weird and sort of arbitrary, but that's what I'm learning how to do through this process. And I think that is one of the most beautiful things about going on a healing journey of any kind, especially a carnivore journey, because my physical cravings for sweet foods and things like that are gone. But there are some emotional cravings still left. And I'm not drinking alcohol this time. I don't have a crutch to fall back on like I did the first time around. I didn't have to deal with this stuff the first time around because I still kept alcohol in my life. But now that I don't have alcohol, I have to figure out how to read the emotional landscape within myself, the emotional signals that my body is sending me and interpret those in a way that is going to guide me to the next step forward. And I think that is the definition of intuition at this point in my journey. It is what I am learning how to do on a level that I've never been able to do before. And it's to follow not just what my mind understands, not just what I academically understand, not just what everyone else is telling me. It's about what is my body really saying? And I think that is what it means to listen to your body. It's to listen to the emotional signals that are coming from your body, not to be ruled by those, not to be in the grips of those emotional signals so that every time I feel angry, I immediately act in anger. And that's not to say when I 
feel feelings of sadness that I, you know, wallow in those or I let myself sit in that darker place intentionally, but it's just to acknowledge them and to say, oh my gosh, why am I having this wellspring of emotion right now? Watching Bill Nod's video about oxalate dumping. That means something. That means that that's connecting with me on a level that I need to explore. And maybe this oxalate thing is a, literally a pain point that I have. And I think that is, that's the insight that, that came to me. And so this is something that I think we get access to when we go on this type of diet and we remove all of this stimulus from our lives. And a lot of it is food. And then that affects the social situations and that affects all these other areas of life. We we kind of get this break from what everybody else is doing and, and all this extra stimulus. And we really get to tune in and find out what relationship do we have with ourselves what relationship do we have with our environments what relationship do we want to have and then we can observe that and make changes and so i think this this first 90 days has been very very enlightening i've learned so much forward to hearing your thoughts and stories in the comments i will wrap it up there for today we ought to get to the park and do some plan i will go soon Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your comments and your support. I really appreciate it.